Thank you. And the conference organizers for allowing me to contribute today via a pre-recorded video. The reason I can't be at the conference in person is because I'm returning from a trip to Indigenous Comic Con in Digipop X in Oklahoma City, an annual visit which has become as important to my work with comics and archaeology as attending conferences like this. And since I can't take questions and chat in person, I'll keep my blog address and email address up on the screen throughout my presentation in case anyone wants to ask me questions directly or have a closer look at my work. By way of introduction, my name is John Swagger, and I've been a more or less traditional archaeological illustrator for almost 30 years. Now, however, I do a lot of work with comics, which is what I want to talk about today. Archaeology is information. It is information about past material culture and human behaviors, it is information about present scientific practice and techniques. It is information about future expectations for heritage and inquiry. All this information can be highly specialized in nature, requiring a meaningful level of understanding and familiarity with the content and context of archaeological discourse. Within the professional practice of archaeology, various languages, spoken, written, presentational, and visual, have evolved in order to ensure that communication of this specialist information is conducted efficiently and effectively. Within the field of visualization, these specialist languages are manifest, from map, plan, and section, to artifact illustration through to cutaway, aerial perspective, phased plans, and reconstructions, archeological visualization has evolved and adopted a broad range of ways in which to convey not just the physical, material, and quantitative nature of archeological data, but also the network, spatial, temporal, and interpretive contexts of that data. Such images tell stories, if you like, Stories about how archaeology sees the past, and stories which, because of the nature of the images themselves, are told in a very particular way. Excellent work has been done over the years in unpicking what all this means for archaeological communication, and what all this has meant for the kind of story that emerges from archaeology about the past. The conclusion, reached by Stephanie Moser, Simon James, and many others, is that archaeologists need to be careful about how they frame their visual communication. And I have also come to another conclusion, which is that archaeologists need to be conscious about how they frame their visual communication, because the kind of images we use determines the kind of story we can tell. Which brings me to comics. Some 15 years ago, when I first started making archaeological comics, comics were just another medium, a tool, which could be utilized to create visualizations with particular aesthetics and feel. What I didn't quite understand then, but which I understand so much better now, is that comics represents not just a medium or a tool, but an approach, not simply an aesthetic choice, but a way of communicating complete with its own ontological frameworks, its own rich and complex language. I have learned that the language of comics, not simply its aesthetics, creates profound differences in how information is structured, how it is presented, and how it is received. These differences are so distinctive that I've come to see them as representing a set of conscious choices on the part of those responsible for communicating archaeology. Choices regarding who speaks about the past, how they speak about the past, and why they speak about the past. As in all things to do with visualization, it is sometimes easier to show than to tell. So, what I'd like to do in this presentation is, first of all, demonstrate how comics work as a medium for communication of information and as a vehicle for public outreach show, through examples of my own comics at work, the ways in which such visual narratives can present new, unfamiliar, and specialist information to audiences, as well as address issues with complex emotional and cultural contextualization, including difficult and contested aspects of heritage. And then briefly note a practical and professional pathway to working with comics in order to build more dynamic relationships with archeology's span broader contributors and audiences. So what exactly is a comic? What exactly do I mean when I talk about comics? Is this a comic? Is this? Is this? Well, the short answer is yes. These are all comics because regardless of subject or intended audience, they use sequences of images to build narrative and convey information. All these comics clearly use a particular way of composing, structuring, and leveraging a wide variety of visual components that are distinct from ways common to photography, illustration, and technical drawing, different again from archaeological photography, reconstruction illustration, and fine These image ways form a language, just as the use of stylistic and graphic conventions in Fine's illustration constitute a language. So what's the language of comics then? One of the most obvious and distinctive differences between comics and other forms of visualization is the presence within any given image of text, not just as caption or commentary, but integrated into the aesthetic and structure of the image itself. Look at any comic, 
and you will see text and image working together to tell the story. It's a partnership between two communication modalities. Some of the information is handled by the text, some by the image. Text alone, Spider-Man might be on a skateboard or driving a car. Image alone, we don't really know why Spider-Man is flinging himself through the air. Together, however, we understand not just what is going on, but also why. In this panel, Spider-Man acts as a narrator for his own actions, offering contextualization and motivation. We know Spider-Man's thoughts about his actions because he offers them to us himself, and I'll come back to the role played by narrators in comics in a moment. In much presentation of archaeological, historical, and heritage information, image and text are associated but separated out. In comics, image and text work together, mutually providing contextualization and explanation, a partnership of modalities, each one contributing something which the other cannot. The second distinctive aspect to the language of comics is the use of sequence. Panel by panel, sometimes page by page, image and text work together not simply to convey static blocks of information, but to create a sense of temporal progression. They convey information from a starting point, through stages, to a conclusion, a beginning, a middle, and an end, a narrative, a story. We're used to such sequences in archaeological visualization. We use them to convey temporality, too, to show the stages in the life history of a place or artifact. In the same way, comics about archaeological subjects can use this progression of pages, this notion of sequence, to unfold not just the life history of a place or artifact, but to present in logical stages information which is new, unfamiliar, and complex. Panels, speech bubbles, and actions become building blocks, and readers engage in constructive understanding through assembling the pieces of information presented to them. This language of comics, image and text working together, the use of sequence, can significantly alter how archaeological information is presented and, consequently, who presents that information and why. So, how does this work in practice? How does the use of comics change the way we talk about the past and what are the consequences? Well, firstly, a narrative presupposes a narrator. Indeed, another interesting facet of modern comics is the presence of first-person narration in the form accompanied by speech bubbles, and, as at Marvel, so in archaeology. The presence of a narrator within archaeological comics does several things. Firstly, it grounds and humanizes work and research that otherwise might seem remote or abstract. Much archaeological information is necessarily, but quite consciously, depersonalized. The site was excavated. Radiocarbon dates show that. Analysis of the pottery suggests. Who excavated? Who dated? Who analyzed? In a comic, however, you can not only show who does the excavation, who takes the dating samples, and who does the analysis, you can have these people talk about their rationale, practice, and outcomes themselves. And by making archaeological practitioners visible, by making them both seen and heard, the archaeology is made less remote, the science is made less remote, the interpretation is made less remote. Archaeology it becomes a human-scaled enterprise conducted by, more or less, ordinary people or not ordinary people. That is to say, expectations of just who is involved in archaeological research and science and why they are involved can be subverted or expanded. The presence of a narrative can highlight the roles played by particular kinds of people in particular aspects of archaeological work, including the, contribu the contributions of local, community, and volunteer workers. When first-person voices are included, it can not only expand notions of who does archaeological work, it can make clear why they do it. This becomes particularly important when archaeology interfaces with areas where visibility, voice, and ownership of the past are difficult or contested. In the case of stories about Nagpur repatriations, done in partnership with both the Native American tribes to whom items are being returned and the museums from which they are returning, the use of narratives can make it clear where certain rights and responsibilities lie. In turn, affording visibility and voice has encouraged those not often involved in archaeological, anthropological, or museum discourse to step forward take part, and ensure that they are literally part of the story. These Niagara comics are collaborative endeavors, where a range of different voices from within Native American communities, from within archaeological institutions, and from within museums are brought together to tell a story that is not just about legal, ethical, or legislative decisions, but about the cultural, emotional, and spiritual contexts of those decisions. In a similar fashion, bringing together the voices of indigenous people and archaeologists in cultural heritage stories expands the narrative outward from the science and the research 
to give visibility to the deeper social and personal meaning of such work, the why of talking about the past. A recent comic about the threat from climate change to cultural heritage sites in the Pacific, for example, was able to talk about not just the science behind rising sea levels and increasing storm intensity, nor simply the archeological and engineering responses to erosion, damage, and flooding, but also about the impact that loss of archeological and historic places has on individuals, families, and communities, their traditions, and lifeways. This kind of melding of voices naturally lends itself to a kind of deep collective working. In all my comics now, when those projects are based here in the UK or abroad, the design and creation of the comic is as much a literal conversation as the end product. In addition to interviews, discussions, and other socially facilitated meetings, this collaboration also takes the form of writing and art workshops. Understanding how comics work from the inside out, as a creator, not just as a reader, becomes part of understanding how comics can work for the story you or your community want to tell. Language is part of this visibility in voice. Comics lend themselves very easily to be reproduced in multiple languages. Sometimes a comic can be published in flipbook format, with the same story told one way in one language and the other in a second. This is particularly useful when communicating with audiences where language choice and learning are intimately bound up in issues of cultural exclusion or educational expectation. That is, when a conversation about the past actually starts being about the present and the future. And choice of language can be a powerful signifier of, owner, of ownership. Here, a comic about a pre-Columbian site in Bolivia was produced in English, Spanish, and Aymara versions. The Aymara edition was, unsurprisingly, extremely popular with indigenous children who attended the local school right next to the site. Equally, the interface of language in the past can be a powerful mechanism for engagement. This year, a comic book I'm working on with the Kumeyaay tribe in California will be translated by the native languages class at Kumeyaay Community College. A rich and dynamic braiding of visibilities and collaborations in archeological storytelling, giving us, I think, some sense of where the how of comics making can lead. Truly collaborative isn't just about what tells the story or why it is being told, it can sometimes be more about in what language and in what context the story can be told. And I should emphasize at no point in these stories is the, is the archaeology forgotten or sidelined, but it becomes one of a number of narrative threads that are intertwined and bound together into a story that is greater than the parts. And I've increasingly come to appreciate how comics has allowed me, my collaborators, and our audiences to gain a sense of the bigger picture. So that's how I've used comics. As CIFA is a place for professional working archeologists, I'd like to wrap up my talk with a few brief notes on how you might use comics, or more generally, how comics can be brought into the archeological workplace. First of all, know that everyone can make comics, really. The art of drawing a comic is a skill, like anything else, and it can be learned. The art of writing comics, sometimes more important even than the drawing, is also a skill, and it too can be learned. There are plenty of excellent books, great online courses, as well as vocational and degree level teaching suitable for everyone from absolute beginner onwards. Second, know that there are plenty of comics artists and writers out there looking for work. If you're interested in using comics to talk about what you do in archeology, span whether as an individual specialist or part of a project or company, buying expertise is both possible and practical. So bringing comics into your archeological workplace could mean either developing comics making in-house as part of broader graphic and illustration practice, or purchasing expertise for one-off projects or projects with known lead times. Thirdly, making comics work could also mean using the production of a comic as a mechanism for collaborating and engaging with communities and other stakeholders, bringing comics artists together with the expertise that already exists in this field within the archaeology and museum studies can be extremely effective. Lastly, is a rich and complex field of worth exploring in technical, stylistic, and commercial history, its deep narrative vocabulary, and the experiences of others before rushing into a project. And so, with that in mind, I would like to encourage anyone interested in using comics in archaeology to get in touch with me directly. I'm not looking for work, but I am both happy and eager to pass on what I have learned about the practicalities of both developing comics making skills and coordinating and running archaeological comics projects. And I'm particularly happy to advise on that most nebulous of starting points for working with comics. The, I think this is something I might be interested in doing, but it's completely new to me, so I'm not sure stage. Again, 
email me. I'm always happy to talk about comics. I'm always happy to discuss how to move a nebulous idea towards an actual project. In an age in which disinformation and fake knowledge can, be, uh, can undermine trust, frustrate research, and derail learning, understanding how to connect with an audience is almost as important as doing good work and talking about it well. The kind of stories we want to tell about the past are inextricably linked to the kind of audiences we want to tell them with. Using comics has allowed me and the community and archaeological partners I work with to make very conscious decisions about what kind of archaeological stories we want to tell. Stories that braid together information and audiences, scientists and stakeholders in distinctive and different ways. Ways that help make the bigger picture of the past more visible. Thank you.